Welcome, I am Josh Hersey. I'm a Spectrum MPI developer at IBM and work with the Open MPI and PMIX open source communities. I'll be talking about MPI and PMIX in HPC containerized environments. I only have time to cover some of the basics and highlight some of the challenges, and I'm happy to elaborate in the panel session or offline if folks have questions or comments. So I broke this talk up into two parts, namely building containers and running containers with MPI. When building a container for an MPI application, you'll need access to the user space libraries for the network accelerator, parallel file system on the target system or systems. This will allow you to build the necessary support into your MPI implementation. If you're targeting support for multiple systems, you may need to have multiple sets of these libraries available at build time, at least your stage one container. For your MPI implementation will need to be compatible with the target system, and this becomes more critical if you intend to replace the MPI library with the system provided MPI at runtime. We'll talk more about that later. One important note that I'd like to remind folks about is that containers cannot contain kernel drivers. And it's easy to think of containers as virtual machines, but they're different in this way. The kernel component of a system library will be defined by the target HPC system. Your task when creating a container is to make sure that you build against a compatible set of user space libraries. An interesting detail to consider here is cross-version compatibility, since you may be bringing a container that was built with an older user space library than is running on the system, or possibly, maybe even likely, a newer version than is on the system. So you need to have a good idea of the forwards and backwards compatibility guarantees provided by these system libraries with a user kernel space component. And this illustration uh, shows you, this diagram shows you one such illustration. So when building a container with MPI for HPC systems, folks generally do one of two things. One, build the container for exactly the software stack on the target HPC system. This will allow you to extract the maximum performance from the system, but you'll need to create a new image for each target system and refresh your container image when the system software updates. Otherwise, so in point two, you can build a container as generically as possible, targeting the broadest set of system requirements that you plan to run against within the container. This may come at a performance loss in any given HPC system, but provides you with more portability between machines and possibly more longevity on a single machine. Be aware that compilers will, are likely gonna introduce architecture specific optimizations for CPUs as well. So you may want to build the container on the same CPU architecture as the target machines. Next, let's talk about running MPI in containers. When it comes to running MPI in containers, there are three big areas of discussion. First, at runtime, the MPI libraries need direct access to the network devices, accelerators, parallel file systems to drive application performance. These are the aspects of the HPC system that the user came to leverage, so MPI needs unimpeded access to deliver the performance the user expects. Secondly, at runtime, the MPI library needs to interact with the resource manager on the nodes for wire up, eventing, dynamic job operations. This is critical for MPI processes to discover each other and connect early in application execution. And then finally, the MPI library will need processes on the same node to have enough visibility of each other to establish shared memory segments. So let's discuss each in turn. Earlier talks discussed how devices can be mounted into the container by the container runtime, so I won't discuss that aspect of this. However, I will focus on how to insert an MPI library that knows how to leverage these devices for MPI operations. I categorize this into three broad techniques. First, you could bring your own MPI and not use the one provided by the target system. The advantage is that you can use the MPI implementation that you know and love, and most importantly, validate it against. It has all of the fun options and potentially non-standard or pre-standard features that your application needs. Biggest disadvantage is that depending upon how you built that implementation, you might not get the best performance compared to the system provided MPI. Next, you can mount the system provided MPI over the top of the MPI installed in your container. The advantage is that you're using the recommended version that's tuned for the system. You'll likely get the best performance and integration experience. The disadvantage is that you need to make sure that your MPI, the MPI you built in your container, is ABI compatible with the MPI that you mount in from the system. The a standard MPI ABI has been something discussed at length for a decade or more in the MPI forum and has not gotten far off the ground. There's good reason why there are ABI differences between implementations that make this discussion difficult. 
However, there exist version pairs of open and closed source MPI implementations that are ABI compatible. Finally, be careful about carry dependencies when mounting in a library like this. For example, some sites have already seen that glibc version differences from inside the container and the mounted MPI can cause the application to fail or even operate incorrectly. So be aware of that. The last option is a blend of the first two. Some MPI implementations like OpenMPI have a component-based design that allow the user to drop in at runtime the adapter for, for example, the interconnect. In this model, you bring your own MPI, drop in the system tune components for the target system. The advantage is that you're still using the MPI you know and love that has all the shiny new features that you want, and that the drivers are also tuned for the system to deliver the best performance. The disadvantage is that you still have an ABI consideration, but one that is maybe more manageable. Instead of requiring that all MPI implementations have the same ABI, you're requiring that a single MPI implementation maintain an ABI at a component interface level for a window of releases. This is likely a much more tractable option with a specific MPI implementation community than going through the MPI forum. You'll still need to worry about carry dependencies, but maybe the surface area is reduced somewhat. So now we have MPI library in place. Let's take a look at how we interact with the resource manager. The MPI library requires a connection with the resource manager on the system. The resource manager could be the one provided by the MPI library, such as Orte or Perte or Hydra, or provided by the system like Slurm or Alps or JSM. The resource manager assists the MPI library in wiring up the MPI processes as they start up, provide them with, provide it with events when things like wall time happens, provide support for dynamic job operations such as CompSpawn. The HPC systems, some HPC systems have a custom non-standard interface between the MPI library and the resource manager. However, many HPC ecosystems have been moving towards PMIX as a community-defined standard API for a programming library like MPI or OpenShmem to interact with the resource manager in as abstract a manner as possible. PMIX is designed to connect to resource managers like CERM and JSM with tools like debuggers and clients like MPI libraries, possibly across container boundaries. The OpenPMIX implementation has worked hard at providing cross-version compatibility assurances for container environments where the version of PMIX inside the container may be older or newer than that used by the PMIX enabled components in the system. This is not an easy task, but one that is necessary for different containerization and runtime modes. The PMIX interface was designed to allow the client libraries like MPI to query the capability of the resource manager and adapt to its supported behaviors. This is helpful when bringing a newer container to an older system, for example. More work is needed in this area. If folks are interested in contributing, please join the PMIX standard working groups or the open PMIX community meetings. In this illustration, you can see OpenMPI with the Orte runtime launching six containers on two compute nodes, one container per rank. The yellow box is representing the container instances. You can see PMIX crossing the container boundary as these red arrows show. It is across this communication boundary that we need to worry about similar cross-version compatibility as we discussed earlier for accelerator and network system libraries. While looking at this diagram, let's consider for a moment the intranode process-to-process -process communication aspect of MPI. Efficient MPI implementations leverage shared memory for unknown communication. If all processes are in the same container instance, with, container instance within a node, then there are no namespace or C-group boundaries between them that impede their ability to use shared memory, at least none that the container runtime would have provided. However, if each process is in a separate container instance, then we need to make sure that containers on the same node have sufficient ability to see and interact with each other across container boundaries. And this boils down to Linux namespaces. In particular, we need to make sure that the PID and IPC namespaces are shared between the container instances. This will allow for the fundamental shared memory operations to proceed. Next, the MPI library needs to be part of the host local file system shared between the container instances if the MPI library is, for example, using the file system to back the shared memory segment or provide rendezvous information. Finally, each container instance on the node should see the same host name since some MPI implementations use this to determine locality on the system. This is defined by the UTS namespace in Linux. Again, PMX could be leveraged here to minimize the sensitivity of MPI library to the host name, but odds are the application and the user are still sensitive to this. 
Finally, I would like to conclude with a brief discussion of containment models in HPC. Namely, should we have one container instance per process or one container instance per node? Historically, the one container per process model was used since it typically did not require any resource manager integration. This is great for older HPC systems. I like to think of it as a container as a large static application binary mode. In this mode, the resource manager is launching one container per process on all the nodes. To the resource manager, this looks just like launching one non-containerized process per node. The job script external to the container will call the native job launch mechanisms such as SRON or JSRON to start their job. And the only thing that's contained is the application binary that's running. The advantage here is that a single job script can launch different containers um, within the same job allocation. And some modern resource managers also provide additional features to help uh, manage uh, container images and leverage that even with scheduling. Some of the disadvantages here is there's boundaries between those ranks that we need to handle the C group and namespace issues with sharing resources on the same node. And depending upon the container, how the container runtime handles it, the memory overhead of a container instance per process can be considerable, particularly as core counts rise. And this reduces the amount of memory available to the app. Alternatively, the one container per node model places one container instance per node with all of the jobs processes inside that instance. The advantage here is that the memory footprint is constant for any number of processes per node since there's just one instance. There's no boundaries between processes, so it feels like running on bare metal. And this is similar to running in a Kubernetes environment for those making that transition. The container script can be defined as part of the container image. Some of the disadvantages, it requires the runtime to be aware of the container to start its job level daemon inside the container instance. The job launch mechanism may need to be used differently since it's being called from within the container. Alternatively, you could use MPI run from within the container instance, but you may need to pay the overhead of launching the daemons instead of reusing the ones provided by the system at runtime. It's a good point for investigation for how PMIX might be able to better smooth over this interaction. So that gives you an overview of MPI and PMIX in a containerized HPC environment. I highlighted a few of the issues, described a number of ways that I've seen clients use containers. Hopefully this will spark some discussion in the panel session.